Okay, uh, let's get it started. So, so today I'm going to continue the discussion that we have last time about uh, approximate inference. Uh, over the last two sessions, two classes, I talked about the optimization view. I introduced. Uh, LVP and variational inference. Today I'm going to start our discussion about another approach uh, which basically views the, the approximate inference from sampling point of view. So you guys have seen this slide probably uh, by now three, uh, four times. Uh, the goal of inferential problems that we solve in this class are mostly in the following form that either we want to compute some sort of a function of the random variable, latent random variable, uh, given the data, or you want to do some uh, kind of marginalization, for example, marginalizing uh, the latent random variable to see how likely the model is given uh, our data, or you want to do prediction, for example, in the context of the time series, uh, for example, HMF. Uh, this way or the other, this, this boils down, uh, we, we end up using the um, Bayes rule uh, that I showed on the top that, um, so, the, the, so for example, if you want to compute the posterior, uh, the denominator is easy, but the denominator uh, requires marginalization or computing some integral that are not easy in, 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 in general. We have shown you this, um, we have covered this uh, slice of, uh, from, uh, in a different class. Um, we talked about, um, this is not working now. So we talked about um, exact message passing um, and variable elimination. We talked about approximate inference from optimization point of view. So today is uh, the time that I'm going to talk about looping. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk about uh, the sampling approach. So we are going to start this section in today's class. Um, all right. So this way or the other, all of these problems somehow boils down to compute an, an integral. And we want to compute an integral uh, that includes some sort of a prob probability. For example, if you want to compute expectation of f with respect to uh, probability distribution p, um, one can say that an easy estimator for that would be drawing sample from p and substituting that in, 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 in f. So that would be probably a very simple estimator. Uh, it's easy to see. Uh, that this estimator would be unbiased. So can somebody tell me why this estimator would be unbiased? So if I sample from P and substitute that in, in F an average, I can use an estimator and I argue that this estimator is unbiased. Why is it unbiased? No, I'm just, so I want to compute the expectation of the, 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 the term on the top. I draw a sample from P, right? So now I have numbers for X, substituting F and average. And argue that this averaging, this averaging that I'm showing right there is, a, is, is equal to the actual, well, so it's like there's no bias. Why is there no bias? times 
Well, what is the law that like, okay, so if you have x, so average x, that average of the x goes to the mean of that distribution. Is there any, anything that tells me that it always, what, is there any condition on probability? Say it again. Yeah, but like, um, why there is no bias to that? So why can't we just say that um, it goes to, what do you mean, 10 doesn't go to there, I don't know why. Um, what, if, what can you say that? What is it? Law of large numbers, right? It's because of the law of large number. Why can't you just say that this is mu plus some epsilon? This epsilon can go to zero, right? right? So why, why do we say that there is some source of bias left at here? That's because of the law of large number, right? The law of large number says that if you average, if you compute the empirical average, it's empirical average, that goes to actual mean because of the law of large number, number and we usually work that AS, which means almost surely, which means that it's gonna happen with no exception. All right, so, um, but the problem here is that, although it's very easy estimator, you just sample from a distribution, substitute that in, in F, there is a variance to this estimator. So if I compute the variance of this empirical uh, F hat, uh, the variance of that decays with the square root of S. So, which means that if you want to control, if you want to have an estimator that doesn't wiggle too much, you have to do, draw a lot of samples, and the behavior of that would be one over square root of s. So, um, probably very simple example of that that, that I, I guess you guys have seen it probably even in high school is that if you want to compute uh, pi, uh, one way of, of doing that is to say that a quarter of the pi, so if I assume a, a, a circle that has a radius of one, and I draw uh, samples from in, in uniformly in a in a one by one cube, and I count number of the point, the proportion of the points that are inside of that uh, red area versus outside is going to convert to pi over four. So and it, it is is equivalent of computing that integral that I'm showing you, right? So this is very simple Monte Carlo examples of computing uh, quantities that might not be easy. And it's very easy to estimate. So you just sample from, uh, draw samples from uniform distribution, apply an if, that this is inside of the red or outside of red area, you've computed that integral. So this is the idea of, uh, the, the, the core idea of the Monte Carlo approximation. So you're going, we are going to see more examples of that in the following. But, uh, well, there is this famous quote that Monte Carlo is an extremely bad method and it should be only used uh, if there is no alternative. So if you have a way to compute an expectation in closed form, you should go for that because it's basically uh, the, at least the vanilla version of the Monte Carlo method as a high value, and that's not what you want. Now, but this is very easy to implement. And you saw that uh, an example of that, and, it's partially, uh, it's part of the appeal of the Monte Carlo method that they are easy to implement. So this, this is why we are still using them. So um, let's just start with uh, drawing uh, a sample from one-dimensional distribution. So if I give you a sample from arbitrary one-dimensional distribution, for example, the, the model I'm showing you red, um, what would be the idea of drawing sample from? So you don't know, so I just gave you a function, py, and I'm saying that this is normalized. So how do you draw a sample from it? Showing that there, but any idea? So why, why, is it, why is it correct? So, yes? You can have a sample along the um, vertical axis. Yes. You know that's just you know, zero and one, and you can sort of project that's, that's, that's fine. Into the, uh, original state. That's correct. 
So basically you are saying that if you give me PDF of the distribution, I can compute the CDF, which is uniform uh, non-decreasing function that here I'm showing with H. And this H is between zero and one. So the H base H of Y is basically for any distribution of the, the sample that I've drawn is less than Y, right? Okay, now this is a CDF and we know it's between zero and one. It's just enough to draw a uniform distribution. We know, let's say I told you, I have a machinery that knows how to draw a sample from uniform distribution between zero and one. All you need to do is that substitute that in, compute the inverse of that Y, and get the distribution. The, 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 the draw from that is, is, is distribution from Y. This is very easy uh, way of drawing samples from uniform distribution. And the reason is that, you know, Y can be, can have any range, it can be minus infinity to plus infinity, and uh, uh, Y it might be difficult to come up with very explicit way of sampling from PY, but this is an explicit, as long as you find a way to inverse HY, which is your CDF, you are fine. And even if you cannot, well, well, if you can, if I cannot uh, find a closed form for HY, can you give me an idea how I can do it approximately? I give you PY, right? And PY is the density. And I want to draw a sample from it, and I, I just don't know how to compute HY in a closed form. Can you give me an approximation? A way that I can do it approximately. Yeah, so you find from that rectangle. And, uh, rectangle. Really oh, the, that this area. Yeah. Only yeah. access to find it is to smaller than smaller than P Y. Um, you are probably referring to rejection sampling, so I'm going to talk about that. But let's say that I don't have a way to compute H Y in a closed form. Can I approximate H1? What's the way to approximate H1? Huh? Numerical integration. Well, yes, numerical integration. But I, I already told you that it's going to be increasing function, right? So it's going to be, it never goes down. So one way of doing that is to bin this PY, right? So which is some way numerical integration. And then build this as a linear function. Right? So because this is going to be a function that looks like this. Right? So I can, I can bin this into a linear approximation. And the, the, it, it always has a linear uh, direction. So it always has a positive slope. It never has a negative slope. Uh, all I need to do is to, is to bin it into different bins and compute the slope. That's all. And I have my approximate HY. And I can invert it. Make sense? Okay, so this would be a very simple way to draw a sample from one-dimensional distribution. But um, things are not always that easy because in many cases, uh, we may not even have a PY as a normalized distribution. In many cases, we have PY which is unnormalized. So we may have it up to a normalization that here I'm representing as PY. So what are the examples of the, of the distribution that we have access to it up to a normalization? We have seen it, right? We have seen it in uh, variational inference. So, what are, so give me an example. If I want to compute the posterior, can I have a posterior up to a normalization? Yes. So how can I do that? It's, all, it's proportional to the, the denominator, right? And computing the denominator in uh, in posterior estimation is easy, right? The denominator is my likelihood, which is coming from my model, multiplied by my prior. The difficulty that I have is computing the denominator. That's the difficult part. But always, most of the time, I can have the, the posterior up to normalization. Right? Okay. So now, somebody told me that, well, that's all you got. You cannot have uh, PY, so because uh, you cannot have, you can have it up to normalization, now you have to draw a sample from it, and it's one dimension. Because I don't have the normalizer, I cannot compute a CDF, so the previous trick that I told you is not going to work. So one idea to do that is to come up with another distribution 
but here I'm calling that Qx. That Qx is easy to draw sample from. So if it's a proper distribution, I know how to draw sample from it. And I say that, okay, so I have this P tilde, which is my Px up to normalization. And I'm going to come up with a k, is a constant fun, is a constant number that if I divide p tilde with k uh, q, it's going to be less than one. So it's basically, I'm going to multiply q as, as uh, uh, and make sure that it includes p uh, p uh, uh, p tilde. Does that make sense? So, and I want to make sure that the ratio of the p tilde and kqs is less than one. So it's always bigger than that. So I want to make sure that the p tilde is always less than kqx. Now I'm going to come up with this trick. The trick is that I'm going to draw a sample from q, because I know how to draw a sample. I chose a distribution that's easy. So I'm going to draw a sample from, uh, from q, and I introduce an auxiliary variable, I call it y. So I'm going to plug the variable that I saw, I draw a sample from Q, plug that into, into this equation, and reject it with this chance. Remember, this is less than 1. So this is correct, right? This is a probability, right? It's a chance of accepting that distribution. And I argue that the accepted samples are coming from actual P. This is the idea of the rejection sample. So the rejection sample says that, well, I don't know how to draw a sample from P. I'm going to come up with another distribution, which is easy. And I'm going to multiply the PDF of that so that it includes P tilde. And then I'm going to introduce auxiliary variable. So this auxiliary variable is acceptance, rejection. Right? And then I argue that the sample that I accepted are actually coming from Px. So if I want to prove this, what should I prove? So I am claiming that if I follow this strategy, the accepted samples are coming from Px, the normalized version. If I want to prove this claim, what should I compute? What should I compute? Is the setup clear? Or no? Yeah, absolutely clear. Yeah, so you only have P tilde, right? You have Q, which you can easily draw a sample from it. You don't have P, you only have P tilde. You have an optimal normalization, and you are saying that I'm going to come up with another Q, which is easy. And I'm going to come up with K so that it includes P, P tilde, and I'm going to accept it whenever with, with the chance of P tilde divided by Ks. And I'm going to argue that actually the sample comes from here. Do you have something to do with um, repeating the rejection sampling and then showing that the differences are constant? The differences are constant. The ratios of. of um... So let's, let's, let's start it this way. So I'm saying that all of the accepted samples are coming from P. Okay. Sorry, so P, P versus P tilde, which one was. Uh, so when I, when I use P star or P tilde, I mean unnormalized. When I use P, I mean the normalized. So if I want to say that all of that, so my, my claim is that all of the accepted sample are coming from the Px. What should I prove? All of the accepted sample. All of the accepted samples has y equal to what? 1. So the distribution of the accepted samples are what? Yes, so if I prove that P of X condition Y uh, equal to one is P, is the, the normalized version I'm done, right? How can I prove it? Right, so I'm gonna write the base rule, given that my pen doesn't work, I'm gonna show you how uh, I'll do it. So, So I have to compute the Px, condition y equal to 1. I'm just going to write the base rule. Py equal to 1, condition x. And there, the q is coming from this distribution, right? Divided by Py equal to 1, right? The normalizer. Is this part clear? 
Then after that, So, remember what this was, right? See that on the top, that py equal to one uh, divided by, uh, given x with uh, multiplied by qx is going to be p tilde by n, right? It's just like by definition. This is how I define it. I just multiply this by qx, I just substitute that in, right? Now, for py, to compute this, I have to integrate x out. Right? To integrate x out, I just substitute the same term and cancel it out. And then I'm going to get p t divided by m and integration of pm. But we know that p t the integrated over all, whole domain is the normalizer, right? So these two cancels out, I'm going to get px. So m was my k in previous slide that there's the big values that I made sure that uh, the blows of k, yes? But uh, you're assuming that that's like the minimal, m is the minimal scaling factor to. Uh, so, so for now, but that's a good point. So I, for now I'm not assuming that. I'm saying that just come up with one m so that m is big enough that if you multiply by qx, p t divided by m q can be less than one. It's not the optimal m. But I'm going to get back to that. And so, but even if it, it doesn't have to be out one, you can still make that assumption that the yeah, exactly. Yeah. As long as it's less than one, it, I just want to make sure that the probability. Because I want to define this condition that p y condition on x it should be less because it's, it's a by it should be a probability, right? It should be less than one. If it is bigger than one, I can't do that, right? It's not bad. But that's a good point. Yes. Say again. Qx. Qx is your proposal distribution. Okay. So, so that is basically the idea of the rejection sample. Now the problem here is that, okay, that works for one di uh, one dimension, and it seems that it's not a bad idea as long as you can find an m which is not too inefficient. But how can I do that for multi dimension? Uh, so also, this idea, yes? Um, what happens if you actually underestimate the bounds on the original distribution, like the what M? Say, say the M actually you chose is not um, big enough to cover the other distribution. Do we have any sort of estimate of how much of error so if you, you So if you choose an M, which is not good enough, then the I remember I introduced an auxiliary variable y. Yeah. And that y should be p y equal to one condition on x should be less than one. Yeah, that wouldn't be a problem. And it should be it should be valid all over x. Yeah, I mean, but numerically that's not uh, checkable. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a normal distribution with identity uh, as a covariance, but it's just a, as, a, as a toy example. So let's say that my proposal distribution is, is, a, is, a, uh, is another diagonal distribution with a variance sigma. Um, again, because P is diagonal, it's factorizable to each of these terms, and Q is also factorizable to each of these terms, right? It's diagonal, right? Now, one way to do that is, that is to say that while P is diagonalized, Q is diagonalized, I'm going to pretend that it's one dimension on each dimension, and we're going to draw a sample from it. It's fair to say, right? Because they're independent from each other. So here's an example that things can go bad. So the acceptance rate of this is going to be, remember the acceptance rate would be Y for the one condition on X. And because, because it's factorizable, it's going to be factorizing into multiplication of the D distribution. D is the dimensionality of X. Right? Now, remember I told you that this term is less than 1. And you are multiplying D of these together. So it's some value less than 1 that multiply D times together is going to decay with the dimensionality and has a terrible acceptance rate. So it decays exponentially. So it just shows that this idea is not going to fly in high dimension because you have very low chance of accepting the rate even for a small number of dimensional. Is this clear? Another idea is um, to, to view it slightly differently. So one way to, to say that is, uh, well, most of these cases, I want to compute some sort of like expectation. Let's say I want to compute an expectation of f with respect to, uh, to, to px. But I don't know how to draw a sample from px, I, because I only have px up to a normalizer. So I don't know how to draw a sample from it. What if, if I you know, massage this equation? So I'm going to uh, multiply it by qx and divide by qx. And qx is a distribution that is easy for me. I know, I know how to draw a sample from it. What is interesting about that is that by multiplying and dividing by that, I can write the equation as expectation with respect to qx, that I know how to draw a sample from it. Is the trick clear? I come up with another distribution that is easy for me. I know how to draw a sample from it. I divide and multiply it by, by q. Now, I wrote my original expectation to another form of expectation, but this time I'm drawing sample from q, which I, it's easy for me. Now, so I told you that one of the ways that uh, one of the ways of doing uh, this uh, uh, estimation is to view it as a Monte Carlo. So I'm going to uh, write as an empirical estimator that I'm going to draw samples from Qx and substitute that in the remaining term. So the remaining term is not f, but is f multiplied by px pxs divided by pxs. Is this clear? Now, so the, the general idea that we did was that px was hard for us. We come up with another proposal distribution. It's easy to sample from it. And multiply and fix this effect by basically dividing, coming up with a weight. That this weight is proportion of px by qx. Um, but still we need to have px divided by, by qx because I told you I don't have the px. I have, I have the px up to a normalization. So what, how can I approach this problem? So I have a px. I didn't have access to px exactly. I have access to p tilde, which is px up to a normalization. And I said that I'm going to come up with another distribution that's easy to sample from, call it qx. And I, I'm going to rewrite the original expectation, which was respect to p, to another expectation, which was respect to q, draw a sample from q, and substitute that in. The problem is that I don't know how to compute this term. Because although I know q, I know p up to normalization. So what's the right way to do that? Any idea?
So let's write it down. So remember, so let's say that my P is my P tilde by some divided by some normalization I don't have I don't have access to. So what how can I write ZP? What is a ZP? If I write it as an integral, what is it? Huh? Yeah, that's a normalizer, but can I write it as an integral? Huh? Yes, so it's like ZP is integral of the P tilde over the entire domain. Right? That's what ZP is. You just want inter you want to normalize the distribution, you integrate over the domain, and that's your normalizer. So I can write the, uh, the, the denominator and, and do the same trick. So the original thing that I wanted to compute was this term and divided and multiplied by Q. And that's my normalizer. And the, 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 I did the same trick that I showed the previous slide on the top. I rewrote the same thing, except that I wrote the ZP as an integral and applied the same trick. The nice thing is that this becomes an expectation, right? This is an expectation of this term with respect to QS. <coughs> and so is the denominator that I can still do that. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to draw a sample from Q. Let's say I draw Q sample. And I write each of these terms on the denominator and denominator as an empirical expectation. So the one on the top becomes one sample from Q with a substitute with the rest of the term, and similarly for the bottom. But what is nice thing about it is that these guys have the same form, right? They all have the same form. This and this have the same form. Which means that all it says is that even if you have, even if you, let's say that you even, I'm going to extend it even beyond that. So let's say that you have a distribution like Q that's easy to draw sample from it, but you don't have to draw sample from it, but you don't have the exact Q. You don't have the exact form of the Q. You just know how to draw sample from it. Let's say that an example of that is the, is let's say that you move the, you move the, you, you draw a sample from normal distribution and you move the sample. The resulting distribution does not have a closed form, but you still need to draw a sample from it. So all you need to do is that you compute these weights and normalize it. And this is the idea of the important sampling. So the idea of the important sampling is that you want to compute, you, you want to perform some sort of inference. And you write this inference as an expectation. And usually this expectation is not easy to compute. You come up with another proposal distribution that you know how to draw a sample from it. And you compute this unnormalized way that are the ratio of your unnormalized P that you didn't know how to draw a sample from it divided by Q that is easy for you and normalize it and compute an average. Yes. Why is there, what, what is Q tilde? So I, I just like, I said that even if you don't have Q up to it, so you do know how to draw a sample from it, but even you don't know how, the, the exact form of it, you, you know it up to a normalizer, you can still do it. But for simplicity, if that's confusing for you, assume that Q tilde is Q. But I just wrote it in more general form, that sometimes your proposal distribution is only thing that generates sample for you, but you don't know how the exact form of Q exists. If I give you a Q, if I give you a sample, you cannot tell me what the density of that, uh, uh, what the PDF value of that point is. You know it up to a normalizer. I'm saying that even for that case, it's okay. So an example of that is that, let's say that you want to have some sort of like a fancy distribution that, let's say that it's a, uh, it's a normal distribution that passed through a deep learning network and perturb to another point. After passing through, per, through a network, you don't know the distribution of the resulting uh, point, right? But you can still draw a sample from it. You can draw a sample from, let's say, normal, pass it through a network, that here you go, that's your sample. Okay. Um, so that's the idea of, is, is the idea of important sampling clear? Because you're gonna end up seeing that in the whole work. Yes. 
relation between T over Q is hard to calculate, but why is the uh, Q of that? Ah, so I wrote, so the ZP is hard to calculate, right? Because ZP is integral of, of P tilde X dx. That I don't know how to compute. But it, it looks like an integral, right? And let's say equivalent to C here. So if I ignore this part, this is the Z tilde, right? It's integral of P to PX. I wrote this as an integral. But because I multiply and divide it by QX, I can view that expectation of this guy. I wrote an integral as an expectation. Make sense? So the ratio between Q and Q is still easy to calculate. Yes. The ratio is easy to calculate because you, you have the PT. P tilde is unnormalized distribution. You, you have that one. And Q you also have it because your, your choice is you, it's your, your degree of freedom. Like you can choose, choose it however you want to choose it. Um, so that ratio is easy to compute, but computing expectation, that expectation is hard. The actual expectation. So it ends up being known. Any question about important sampling? Should we move on? Easy? No? Okay, so now the good thing is that this estimate is consistent but biased. If you have, uh, so this introduced bias distribution. Also, you, uh, well, this is some sort of like a uh, it's kind of not the whole world, but you can go and uh, prove it yourself. Is that even if you have your Q up to a normalizer, the ratio of the normalizer with the average of unnormalized weight, remember that this was a weight and you have to normalize it later. So, so this is why I use P tilde. If you average those unnormalized weight, it's going to give you ZP divided by ZQ. So the, what is good thing about this is that if you have a proposal distribution that's easy to compute, so you know the ZQ, by com computing this average, you can get the ratio of the ZQ by, uh, divided by ZQ. That usually means that you can have an estimate of the marginal likelihood that's so it's basically the denominator in your posterior ex, uh, estimation. And that's what we use most of, uh, that's, that's can be used, for example, for model selection and things like that. So I'm just saying that the unnormalized weights, also the average of unnormalized weight uh, yeah, carry in, in important information for us. So, so what are the pitfalls of the important sampling? So first of all, what would be the best QX, the best proposal distribution. You want to draw, you wanted to compute an expectation with respect to P to compute an average of, compute expectation of FX. If I give you a P, that would be the perfect one, right? It would be the best match. There's no, uh, so that's, ob that's the obvious best match. Um, but of course, if we, we had P, we didn't need to do any uh, proposal distribution and all that is, is a ridiculous choice. Um, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a good idea to use this as a, to analyze what, how the behavior of this proposal distribution would be and how it would behave in high dimension. So if you want to, um, actually this pen would have started working. Okay, so, so let's study the behavior of that. So let's say that I want to, um, so remember this is, let's say, that this is my PX. Yeah. And this is my proposal distribution. So I told you that the best choice would be when they match completely with each other. So one way to study how it behaves in a high dimension would be to study QX divided by PX 
and Px divided by Qx. So in this case, I'm going to draw a sample from Px. In this case, I'm going to draw a sample from Q. And it's very hard is to are uh, different from each other. So if they, these two distributions are matching very well, so this ratio become one. So the variance of this weight, so I'm going to call one of them ui, uh, uh, this one is going to be uh, uj. So if I study the variance of these two, study the variance of these two weights, it's going to be a, a way that how p and q are matching with each other. Because if they match really well, it's going to be 1. And the variance of ui minus uj is going to be 0. Right? It doesn't matter one is above the other, they're going to produce almost like a flat, uh, flat value. So one way to do that is to study this, this uh, quantity. So, so if I expand, so here by uh, bracket, I'm sh uh, showing the uh, computing this uh, empirical, uh, computing this expectation, I'll get one sample from Px or Py. If I expand that, I'm going to have a term, so I'm not going to go through the proof, but what you are going to get, assuming that, let's say, that in high dimension, for simplicity, because it's easy when things are factorizable, at least in terms of analysis. Let's say that I have a high dimension, B dimension for x, D dimension for y, and these are factorizable. So this expectation, you can uh, prove that it boils down to, uh, to computing the expectation of the first one that I showed you. They're going to draw sample from this. So, so you, you're going to see that in the homework that this value is bigger than 1. Now, the question is that if I, for d dimension, if I have a value which is bigger than 1, what would happen? Why I don't like doing important sampling in high dimensions? Don't you understand why? Like, why we don't take the variance of the u and rather than that, we find this measure? Like, what is it? So, remember I told you that the best choice between p and q is that when they match. If you only focus on u, but not on q, I can make the q much bigger than, 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 than q and dominate, right? Depends which one you choose. Let's say that you, I think if you choose this one, I can make this q so big that dominate this term. I'm gonna dominate this term. There's no value. If you choose the other one, I'm gonna choose the p, so that this is too big. So, you don't want your p to overestimate or underestimate your, uh, the other one. You want them to match. So you, this is why you say that ui minus uj. Because say that whenever p is going to dominate q and whenever q is going to dominate p. This is why you are saying that if they are matching very well, if they say they are completely following each, each other, this, this should be like one all over the place. And computing the variance of that would be you know, zero if uh, uh, there's no value, there's always one. Make sense? You want to make sure they're matching, right? Sometimes Q dominates Q, sometimes Q dominates Y. By studying these two, I'm make, make, making that symmetric. Okay. So, but what, is, what would be the problem if this value is bigger than one for in high dimension? The variance of this would be what? Is the value slightly even slightly bigger than one? You and the these dimensionality, this is going to be a very big number, and it's going to exponentially become a big number, right? Because it's, it's, it's exponential to the d. So this is the reason that in high dimension we don't use this because here I'm just showing you that this value. Is going to explode. The variance of the weight is going to explode. So, um, so here is an example. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to um, give you the the IPython notebook to to, uh, to try it later on. But uh, because of our setting up, I wasn't sure that the IPython notebook uh, 
the demo usually doesn't work when you want want it to work. So, so here I'm showing you two probability distributions. So P, so both of them are very simple. Of course, we know we know how to draw sample points. But one of them is P centered at zero, and Q is a proposal distribution. So, and I, let's say that I want to compute the mean. Right. So. The, one, the, the value that you see on the top is a, is, is a log of the variance of this proposal distribution, the red line. And the mu is the center of this uh, P. Right? So I'm going to play with that, see how it works. So if I expand the log, so, so you see that the proposal distribution becomes flat and flatter. So you, you're gonna, it's going to cover bigger areas of the domain. So now, um, and as it becomes bigger and bigger, you see that like, the, the variance of this estimation, the, the, the difference between the red line and blue, uh, blue line uh, starts increasing. So now the next thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to make the proposal a bad proposal. So the actual P is around here, and proposal distribution doesn't know it. So proposal distribution becomes off. And as you see that as, as I expand the word there, so that my estimation becomes become off. So my red is my estimation, that the blue is the actual estimation. A remedy to that would be, although I don't know the mean of that, but one way to do that is to expand to make this proposal distribution wider because it doesn't know where the mean, actual mean, mean is. So I'm going to expand the, uh, the proposal distribution and making it wider, so that by making it wider, it covers more area and reduces the variance between the actual and the estimation. But what would be the problem if I make the variance of that too big? Maybe I'll, I'll release this and you, you, you play with this and uh, you realize. But hopefully you, you saw the balance between these two, that if you have a proposal distribution which is off, it depends how wide that is having off distribution can result in bad estimation. So this is why to, uh, this is why to avoid that, you usually use a wider proposal distribution. But um, one intuition for that would be, let's say that I have, a if I have a proposal distribution which is off. <coughs> so if I have a proposal distribution that's off, So let's say that this is my actual P. And this is my Q. So this is my proposal distribution. This is P. Right? So I'm going to sa draw sample points. So most of the samples will be around here. Because this is the peak of the, the proposal distribution. And sometimes it has something here, sometimes it has something here. So is it clear? The drawing sample from QS. And then, based on the ratio between them, I'm, go I'm going to assign a break to this. But all of this is going to be very small, right? Because the ratio of this is small, so they're all going to be very small. So it ends up to have very, so maybe like one break, which is gigantic, and all of them is decreasing. So all of them will be on these guys gonna be big and the rest of them is gonna be very, very tiny. So this is one of the issues in uh, important sampling that when the Q and P are far from each other, so the weight, only one of the only few of the weights get a gigantic weight, and the rest of them are tiny. And that results in very bad estimates. Is it, is, is it clear why it's resulting into bad, bad weight? Because the ratio between, so remember how I compute the weight. The weight, the weight that I computed the weight was Pxi in the Qxi. And this is small, right? In this area, this guy is small. This is why the unnormalized weight would be small, and when I normalize it, it becomes tiny. 
So I end up with, when I normalize it, it this guy is going to be, let's say, like kind of 70 percent of the grid is only one part here, and the rest of the part we have defined here. And that's one of the properties. Important stuff. Is it clear? So one remedy to that is uh, so-called resampling. So the idea of the resampling is that if the P and Q were very similar to each other, let's say the P and PX and QX were almost identical, the weight would have been what? Yeah. Close to one, and if I normalize it with one over L. Right? So one way to do that is to when you draw particles like this, and you resample from this as a because like right now you have discrete particles, you, you view it as a discrete distribution, and you basically draw a sample from discrete distribution and give a weight one over L to all of them. It's gonna solve the problem partially, but not completely. But nevertheless, is a is, is a thing that people do in practice quite often. So, um, so what would be so? How can I extend this idea? So, it, it, what I showed you was basically vanilla version of the important sample. So, how can I extend this idea to higher dimension? Uh, I told you that if you just apply important sampling to higher dimension. It's gonna the variance of the weight's gonna explode. So basically, you are going to have uh, one particle or few particles with the gigantic weight, and the rest of them are tiny that result in the big variance. And this behavior is pretty bad in high dimension. One idea of using important sampling is to use the structure of the graphical model. So here I'm using an uh, I'm showing you an example of the graphical uh, graphical model. So maybe we can take like two minutes two minutes break, and uh, we can explain this idea of the, extending the, uh, the idea of the important sampling to higher dimension. Two minutes break. All right. So let's get started. Um, the idea here is that how can I extend this idea of the important sampling to, to a higher dimension? So an example of the higher dimension is a sequence of, of, of uh, sample. So let's say that you have a sequence, looks like this, x1, x2, and the object that we have is basically the entire high dimensional object. So let's say if I have n uh, sample in the chain, for example, in hidden Markov model and, and so on, this is an example of high dimensional distribution. So every draw from that would be this chain. So for example, here I'm showing a chain of, uh, of, of, L, uh, of, of, of you know, L samples, and then the chain has it at the length of T. So the idea of extending important sampling to a higher dimension is to construct the weight in a recursive way. So 
So here I'm showing you a very simple example in the context of the chain graphical model, which is like easy to analyze, but you can also extend this idea later on to a, a uh, to more complicated graphical model. So the idea here is that instead of fixing, so, so remember we have a proposal distribution that was supposed to work for the entire space. So here, the idea here is that, M, so we draw, so let's say that we have T uh, dimension. So we draw samples from each of these samples and every step of the way we are gonna change the proposal distribution. And that's basically the gist of the idea of the so-called particle field. So you don't keep the proposal distribution constant, but as you go toward, in, 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 toward, uh, toward the end of the chain, you update your proposal distribution. You don't use one proposal distribution. So how would you come up with a weight? Because remember, our weight was this ratio of the P, T x divided by Q. So given that Q is changing, so how can I come up with a weight? With a weight? So the idea here is that we have a weight for every step of this chain, we are, going to have, we are going to have updated weights. And we are going to construct the weight in the recursive way. So how do we do that? Remember that our weight was this ratio of the, the distribution. The actual distribution, which was unnormalized, divided by our Q. But I told you that if you do it naively, uh, in high dimensions, it's gonna blow up the variance as a, as a bad behavior. But let's expand this term. This is not just any arbitrary weight. It has some sort of a structure. So how do you suggest to expand this weight and use the structure of the graph model? Remember, this is basically a graphical model that I showed at the top. So it has some sort of a chain structure. So how can I use this structure? How can I, so maybe one idea would be to expand this weight on the top and the bottom. Can I condition on something that makes it look like recursive? Remember the graphical model looks like this. So it has some sort of recursive structure. Yeah, so let's, let's condition on previous one. So if I want to, so if I have a step t minus one, I'm gonna draw another sample which is xt, Let's condition on the rest of the, the, all of the previous one. So all I'm going to do is I didn't change anything. So I basically what I had is that it's a, it's a chain rule, right? I condition on the previous of previous samples, and I want to compute the uh, expectation with res with respect to current point at t. And similarly for q. Now what you can see here is that what is this term? So if I call this so here by W tilde, I'm, I'm saying that unnormalized weight. And T means up to, uh, to point T, and L is L sample. So what, but this this term has the same form as the other one. So what should I call this term? You see the recursion? What is this term? If I use the same rotation, what should I call it? So this is W T minus one L. So all you're going to see, you see, you are going to see some sort of a recursive rule. So remember, if you have a weight here, constructing the next weight would be using the previous weight multiplied by the ratio of only conditional. So all you need to come up with is coming up with this, which is small dimension. Remember, each, if, let's say that if each of the x's are one dimension, this is only one dimensional important sample. And we know that it does not behave that bad. And we have all of the tricks of resampling and all that, so with small dimensions, we are fine. So the basic idea here is that we are going to construct the, the, the weights on a t minus one, update uh, based on the ratio, and move forward. And that's the general idea of the so-called uh, important sampling. So let's just start with that and then like, let's focus on, on, on model which is like somewhat uh, useful for us. So let's say that we are not given a chain, we also have some observation. So let's say these are observed. So 
our previous recursion rule that I showed you at the bottom, so remember that was our recursion rule that I showed you in the previous slide, has to modify it slightly because we are, right now we have some observation. So all I need to do is to change this P because right now this is not just probability of PHIs. It's also probability of PHI and the effect of that on observation. So all I need to do is, you know, change this to account for the observation. See that? So all I added was the probability of HIs and multiplied by the observation. That's all I need to do. Now, remember that I have a freedom over the choice of the proposal distribution. I can choose the proposal distribution however I want. So one way to, to make it easy would be make these two equal to each other. I have freedom to choose it, right? So I'm going to set them equal to each other so that they cancel out. So my new recursion weight is, go is going to be basically by setting that equal to the conditional, I'm going to have the previous uh, recursion, recursion weight multiplied by the effect of the observation. Right? This is the effect of observation. which updates the weight recursion. So, yeah. so now let's say that, remember, so uh, you guys probably remember uh, the idea of the forward and backward pass in hidden Markov model. So we had the forward message that goes from, from one end of the, of the chain and another message that uh, goes from the other end. So, all of these messages are basically some sort of like an integral. So you're sending the messages all the way to the, the end of the chain and you're receiving it. So you are computing some sort of integral. So what would happen if I compute, want to compute that integral using uh, uh, this kind of approach, basically sampling approach. So, so one idea would be, um, so computing the message that goes from, so let's say that this is HT, and I want to see the effect of all of this up to this point. So that boils down to computing the effect of observation at my current point and integrating out the effect of all of it, rest of it. And I don't need to uh, compute, uh, only, so I only, because of the structure of the graphical model, I only need to know the previous one. If I know the previous one, it's because of the Markovian, Properties, I don't know the, the rest. So I all I need to compute is computing this expectation. Again, we come up with another recursive weight. We have a message that we, we are passing at point T and all of the previous messages. Similar to the idea of the message passing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate this term with important sampling, right? So, um, so remember, I was building these weights recursively. So I already have the sample up to this point. So I'm going to put some delta function with their own weight. So as if they have a bunch of particles, right? A bunch of particles. This is my h t minus one. So I have a bunch of particles. So these are my particles from previous up, uh, from previous step. So what would happen, so if I write this as sort of a delta function that I'm centered at ht minus 1, so it's going to look like a bunch of delta function here, sort of my previous weight. All I need to do is computing this integral. Well, computing integral with respect to delta function is one example. It's just like putting the center of this at those delta functions and smoothing that out. Right? So if I have So if I want to compute this is the function, let's say one, this is the function two, what would happen, let's say that if I do f2x
exactly. It just reads that form, right? It's like as if it's like a look, acts like a lookup table. But it's a lookup table from a, from a function. So all it does is that you just have to substitute these HIs into this. So if I want to re show it as a particles, so remember these H I, the WIs are my particles. I'm going to draw a sample because I, I don't like the, the particles that are too imbalanced. So I'm going to do resampling so I get the weight that looks like this, that are all uh, equally distributed after resampling. So this was my W T minus 1. And after resampling, I'm going to get uh, behavior like this. And after doing integration, which is this, it's got, all it does is going to smooth the function. So as if I put a bunch of, so I assume that Vx, Ht are just sort of like a smooth function. I just put them on the top of this. Uh, function and, and all I'm going to do I'm, I, all I'm going to get after that is a smoothed version of this particle sequence and I'm going to do resampling them. so this is very sketch uh, uh, so um, this is a sketch of the particle filters that basically the, the general idea is important sampling but for higher dimension so the idea is that important sampling is hard for higher dimension but you want to use the structure of the graphical model so all you do is this so you, instead of building the, the, the weight in one pass, you gradually build the weight. And all you do is that in every step of the way, so I, I explain it to you in the context of the, of the chain, but in every step, step of the way, you build the chain, you use the structure of the graphical model to redistribute the weight and continue. That's basically the general idea of the, of the particle filter. So, but so far, the general idea of the sampling are, so first of all, we have to come up with a proposal distribution that's easy to sample from. I don't know how to sample from the original distribution, but I can come up with another distribution that's easy to sample from. And that's my proposal distribution. Next idea to extend it to higher dimension that I'm going to discuss in the, in the, in the, in the following uh, classes are that we don't want to fix the proposal distribution. We want to change the proposal distribution based on the current state of the system. And you saw an example of that in the context of particle filter, that we use the structure of the graphical model to choose uh, to, to change the structure of the proposal distribution. And that usually behaves better in higher dimension. So these are uh, basically the general idea of the sampling. Another big uh, sort of like a, a reoccurring idea in, in, a, in a world of um, sampling effort for inference is to introduce some sort of like auxiliary random value. So remember that we introduce an auxiliary random value to accept or reject the sample in a, in a rejection sample. So um, that is an idea that you see quite uh, that reoccur again and again in a different variant of the sample. So the rejection sampling is probably the most simplest way of introducing this auxiliary variable but it's quite inefficient. The reason it's efficient is that if you choose that M really bad, so the M, your M is gigantic, you end up rejecting a lot of samples. So one idea would be, why should I discard the samples? So is there any way that I can use those samples and you know, you know, adapt it or adapt the queue so that the, the number of the, the wasted resources is, is minimized? And another idea is that uh, while sampling in high dimension is difficult, and we saw that uh, uh, some ideas how to uh, use the structure of graphical model to alleviate this problem. But um, another idea would be, in none of these examples that I showed you, I, you, I didn't use the smoothness of P. So if the P is very smooth and some area is very flat, why should I waste so much resources uh, on that? So why not using the gradient information of the P into our sampling. So all of these, uh, um, so basically the, the, the today's class was sort of like a warm up uh, for um, the, the, the two of the, the, the most important ideas of the important sampling that I'm going to discuss in the following classes. But basically the idea of the class today was that, well, this, the vanilla version of the sample, so the, the, this is, these are the big ideas in, 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 in sampling, using proposal distribution, changing the proposal distribution, using the gradient of, of the P 
and adopt, uh, using the structure of the graphical model. So in the following classes, I'm going to use different, I'm going to propose different algorithms that uses this idea for uh, sampling. So because I don't want to rush to, to keep sampling, I'm going to stop the class now. Thank you.